Hi, good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for tonight's event. So this is actually the last in the series of public program events that we've been doing to accompany Jean Dubuffet Brutal Beauty at the Barbican, which runs until the 22nd of August. So if you haven't had a chance to see it, you've got a few weeks left. And we really wanted to use the public programme as an opportunity to platform a range of artistic voices who each in their own way felt inspired by Dubuffet's work, but who in turn had a practice that we felt was really inspiring and relevant today. And it is no exaggeration to say that number one on that list was Adam Green, who wow. I'll very briefly <laughs> introduce. So um, Adam is really a great creative polymath, maybe known to many of you as a musician, but also a writer and visual artist. And I think Adam and I will just be having quite a free ranging conversation this evening about your practice and Dubuffet's and all the kind of sticky, tactile, sex sexy situation in between. Um, maybe we should start, um, we were just, discussing where we might begin, but um, your film Aladdin yes. uh, was a remaking of that classic historic tale, but very much rooted in Dubuffet's work. Definitely. So I wonder whether we want to begin with that so that those who are joining us who maybe haven't seen the film or don't have a sense of that can see very directly that relationship. Okay, cool. So you have the trailer for it, right? Rachel, what? Rachel's gonna, is gonna bring that up. You partying tonight? Oh yeah, mate, what we getting into? Yeah. You told me that you spent 30,000 space bucks on cocaine. I only take cocaine to go to Brooklyn. <sighs> Whoa. My father will only let me go on a date with a prince. If you're not married in a month, have to execute you. Got Aladdin, are you okay? I honestly feel that I'm deaf to my own soul. Through that entrance is the wreckage of an alien spacecraft. Yeah. You will come to a garden where a lamp is displayed. This is not an ordinary lamp. If you wish to possess this lamp, you must answer this riddle correctly. What is the most beautiful language in this world? Sign language. The lamp is yours. First question. Can you fuck it? Lord, please forgive my transgressions. The lamp is a printer. I can print you anything that you wish for. to meet a rich person. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you a royal prince. He goes by Prince Average Cabbage. Come with me on a flying rug ride. Uh, let's print out some ecstasy. If we had sex, would that be ironic? They're an actual rebel army that's going to change the world. Wouldn't it be amazing if we joined them? They call themselves the Magical Americans. No gods allowed! You're all under arrest! This place is starting to look like Hollywood. Though we fantasize about filling the stars to their brim. We must change the nature of what we wish for. I've created a printing cult. We can finally have anything that we want! Oh, print me an asparagus chair! Wow! By the way, who are you? A prince is not a prince at all, but a recording artist. For Zintendo Records. You're delivering me a shit sandwich and you hope that I enjoy it? <laughs> I'm so glad we showed all of that because it's it is as a film if anyone who's watching this hasn't seen it you absolutely have to I mean it yeah. is oh, anyone that, you can watch this on YouTube 
Like it's exactly. not that means to YouTube, you can watch the whole movie there. Exactly. And it is just like this sort of combustion of creativity and everything. I, I'm, it's so fun watching it again, just that little snippet there. The asparagus chair. Oh, yeah. Francesco Clemente's like cameo role as the genie. I mean, there's so, so much brilliance to it. But um, tell us a little bit about what made you want to make that film and, and how it kind of related. You know, you said to me at one point when we were talking early on, like Dubuffet is at the root of everything I do or, or kind of the whole world that you've sort of created for yourself. Tell, tell us a bit more about that. I mean, well, you know, I, I think that um, Dubuffet, uh, you know, it certainly influenced the that movie and, you know, in the way that the uh, that the sculptures work. But he's actually been kind of part of my life um, since I started drawing. Like I remember um, when I was a kid, um, my parents had a uh, book about the history of modern art on our bookshelf and um, they so I and I used to look through it and, um, you know, one of the paintings that really caught my eye was this painting that uh, of a car by Dibuffet. And actually, I found the painting so I can I can show it to you. It's um, Oh, you did? Yeah, it's this. Oh, wow. OK, yeah, I know that painting. Yeah, so I was I was a kid looking through this art book and, you know, everything was, you know, like a modernist masterpiece by like Van Gogh or Picasso. And uh, and all of a sudden there was like this kind of cave painting of yeah, a car. Hold it up, hold it up closer. Oh, sorry. Um, Nice. And I remember just thinking like, what the hell is that? Like, honestly, like, just yeah. what is that? You know what I mean? Like, and, and I remember just from that moment, just kind of realizing that there was this sort of very like punk voice that yes. was modern art that I didn't really like, I, you know, I, I didn't really know about until, um, you know, until, until I, you know, just kind of saw his work juxtaposed uh, next to other modern artists. Um, you know, that's because Dubuffet is so distinctive. And I, I think we can talk about that a lot. And did you did you see exhibitions of his work? Do you remember um, the first time that you actually saw any of his work in the flesh? Yeah, I, I think maybe at MoMA or at the Met, I saw like s some of his stuff, and he had some public artworks that were around. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, um, that kind of. but um, it wasn't really until um, I went to the Pompidou Museum mm -hmm. in. France, and I saw a room that Dubuffet had made. And also, by the way, Red Grooms was another big influence of, of mine. And he was a paper mache artist that's sort of mm -hmm. unit based. Um, but but yeah, so I was in a room in the Pompidou, and uh, I went into this, um, you know, this like this sort of handmade um, kind of cave room, and um, it was made out of, I guess, like paper mache or something. And mm -hmm. I remember being really struck by the uh, lines, and mm -hmm. it was really just like it occurred to me that a sculpture could look like a drawing. You know, mm -hmm. it was like really just putting that together, like, oh, you can make sculptures that look like drawings. And I think that that was sort of at the key to, uh, you know, me ma wanting to make the movie Aladdin, which is basically like a giant moving sculpture that moves for like whatever, 90 minutes or something, you know? Yeah, um, it's like a moving sculpture, it's also like a moving drawing because it's yeah. like everybody's inside this kind of animated drawing. And it's interesting because the work that you showed at, at the beginning, that printout that you have, um, that's very kind of indicative of Dubuffet's work in the 40s. And it, that carries on a little bit into the early 50s in terms of this quite tough, gritty aesthetic, right. um, very somber palette. Um, you know, of course, he's always um, oscillating between these two extremes. But when I think of the color palette that you're using for Aladdin, it strikes me as being much closer to the kind of Paris Circus series of the early oh, 60s right, yeah. or indeed of the kind of law loop. Were you aware um, early on of those kind of performance pieces that he was doing? Was there a point which you decided... I, I want to kind of learn more about his work or was it yeah, all definitely. Involved? yeah yeah like I, I, I didn't I mean I just like I think I had a like a kernel to an interest in Dubuffet that kind of hatched more when I was in my 20s mm -hmm. um, you know I think I remember that there was this person in modern art that was kind of seemed like pretty wild but I just mm -hmm. uh, really connected with it in my 20s um you know when I started to kind of expand uh you know into film and and, and visual art and uh, you know in a way like kind of just started you know doing other projects that weren't music um mm. uh but um oh yeah i was gonna say like you know so we had a few slides i wanted to show and one was um yeah was, um what was it was the, the wall you one want to right? start with the mirror the mirror yeah. inscription yeah, yeah it's um this is uh this is an amazing oh, painting show, right? hmm? from your the show that, that that you put together 
Yeah, so it's a good, um, it's in between the book that you have and the show that actually got realized. So it's really nice to be able to talk about this actually, because this is one of the paintings that was going to come to the show and then oh, didn't okay. because of COVID. Um, so I'm really grateful to have opportunities to look at it a bit more and, and think about it a bit more. Because yeah, so um, mm -hmm. it's like, you know, I think that some of these, there's a series, right? This is part of a series. Mm -hmm. and some people well, against that. It's not like um, it's not like a formal series, but it's you know we could loosely group them together as a body of work that he makes right. around this period devoted to walls. Yeah, and, and the walls kind of are um, graffitied over, and mm -hmm. um, and they kind of have this um, like uh, palimpsest of uh, you know like uh, old like almost like the old, old walls of uh, of Rome. Mm -hmm. but I think that people in some of these ones are pissing on the wall, right? Yeah. So I don't yes. know if it's like pissing, but some of the some of the ones that he drew are people pissing on the walls. Yeah. So they have a punk feeling to them. Yeah. Uh, but I was going to show you. Um, and and uh, hold on, I I had a few. Okay, I'm going to show you this because okay, so we we basically were like um, we were uh, what do you call it um, like trying to find artists that were influenced by Dubuffet, and there's certainly been a, a lot of them, like Clay mm -hmm. Solberg, and mm -hmm. uh, I think one of the ones that for me is most important is uh, Cy Twombly. Um, yeah, 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 absolutely. Is there a way that we can take it off this slide? Yeah, we can. Okay, so Thank you, Magic Mitchell. I made my own slides this morning, like at the copy shop. I love this. I love the like analog digital combo. This is perfect. Okay, let's get this close. Cy Twombly. <laughs> this is called Amazing. Uh, Academy. So, you know, I, I think this is like a really interesting example of how, you know, you can see de Buffet's um, influence on it. Um, but also it's not just that, it's like a tradition of kind of um, graffiti um, <laughs> that comes from um, Roman graffiti. And, you know, and, and I was gonna show this, I thought this was kind of funny that uh, this is like, have you guys ever seen the movie uh, Satyricon by Fellini? Have you ever seen that? Uh, seen which one by Fellini? A uh, Satyricon. No, man, I haven't seen that. Tell me Bellini's, more. It's Fellini's uh, version of the Petronius novel uh, from you okay. know from Rome, and so the, it opens with actually with this shot. Okay, here we go. <laughs> this is amazing. So this is this is actually like the protagonist of Satyricon in front of a whatever scraffito. How do you say scraffito wall or something? <laughs> Yeah, I never know what you do with that, like, S, how silent that S should be. Where, uh, and that's in Rome? I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, like, supposed to be in Rome. He probably did shoot, shoot it in contemporary Rome. Uh, but but I was going to say that I, I think that there's – it's kind of funny because there's something – okay, what my, I, I guess what I want to say about it is there's something classical about graffiti, like, mm. that's what it's too, is, you know, there's always been an underside of the classical world that has been graffitied on walls – you know, in the bathroom or in, you know, whatever, like the vomitorium or whatever. I don't know what it is, but like there's been like graffitied walls and, and, and there's something classical about it. And the Cy Twombly definitely uh, points towards that in his work. You know, and I feel like, you know, De Buffet uh, as well, um, you know, they kind of point to this sort of punk under sub subcultural side of like the classical world. And I was going to say that this is just the last Thing I wanted to show for this particular body of work, but this is actually from Da Vinci's notebooks. Like, you know, the Codex Atlanticus is yeah, sort of yeah, 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 yeah. So, for the people who are watching, like, the Codex Atlanticus is basically like Da Vinci's diary, and I think maybe even the Vitruvian Man, you know, that's like that guy that's like a lot of all those famous sketches that you've seen to Da Vinci are from this particular Codex, like, manuscript. And this is actually from there. Um, it's oh my like, god, I've never seen that. <laughs> So, and I don't know, I mean, I'd like to think that Da Vinci did draw these dicks, but- Okay, it, so Adam, um, talk us through what that image is. It looks like dicks that are sort of- Chicken? Uh, Ch yeah, like yeah, like yeah, chicken like, feet? Yeah, they have like an animal quality, like a, yes. <laughs> yeah, they have an animal quality. You, you could say like somebody else got into his manuscript and drew it on and that's possible. I just, it's just funny to think that Da Vinci- The repetition is interesting there as well, right? Did two of them in one. Yeah, this is actually this is a sacred uh, geometry. Yeah, this is um, <laughs> this is actually a complicated mathematical riddle that <laughs> Da Vinci was was working on at the time. 
So this is a perfect opportunity for me to remind everybody who's watching that we do have a chat function and that if you want to leave either comments in the chat or questions for Adam about the complex mathematical riddles that he's putting up onto the screen, then <laughs> feel free to do that as we go and I'll try and weave them into the conversation. Okay. Um, I think um, to start with the question about graffiti, because this is something I've been thinking about and talking about a lot recently, and it just brought to mind um, the amazing quote from René Ricard, which has been like really resonating in my mind. So when René Ricard writes the great piece about uh, the Radiant Child, about yeah, uh, Keith Haring and Basquiat, and it's the first piece that's really published in Art Forum, um, but he talks about exactly that. He says, any tag by any teenager on any train on any line is fairly heartbreaking in mm. these autographs is the inherent pathos of the archaeological site the cry down the vast endless track of time that i am somebody on a wall in pompeii on a rock at piraeus in the subway graveyard at some future archaeological dig we ask who was tacky so like i say that just because yeah I mean, uh, but that's also, that's René Ricard in 1981 saying that. Yeah. And I think um, to think that Dubuffet was recognizing this in 1944 in Occupy Paris at a point at which those walls were also really poignant spaces where messages could be left. So some of what he copies off those walls is seemingly quite trivial. There's really sweet messages like, the key is under the shutter or I love you, Lucille. But there are also messages that are being left by resistance fighters at the time who don't, you know, censorship is so heavy at that point that right. we don't know how many of these messages were actually coded. And um, on the BBC free service at the time, there was this famous thing where people like randomly in the midst of programs, you would have a message like, um, you know, the king of cabbages or whatever. And somebody somewhere would know that that was a message intended for them to say that there was safe transit for them to travel to Portugal, wow. whatever the message was intended to be. So there's so many layers of coding within the way in which Dubuffet is like inscribing these walls. And as you say, it's like, it's a palimpsest of the time, but it's also reaching back to these archeological sites, you know, reaching back to the ancient graffiti yeah. in Pompeii, but it also somehow reaches forward to those uh, artists like Herring or Basquiat and beyond yeah. to a kind of future yeah. generation of artists. So it has that amazing yeah. energy and vitality, which is classical and contemporary totally at the same time. Um, yeah. I was thinking that like, one of the things that's so cool about um, when people make um, like marks on walls and stuff and, you know, is I think maybe because they're done quickly and they're done kind of crudely mm -hmm. because of there's textures that are part of the walls that kind mm -hmm. of, and they do them actually with like a, quite a bit of force, um, is the line quality. And I think this is like kind of maybe yes. the most distinctive thing about the buffet is like, you know, and this is kind of like going back to that, um, to this. And then maybe when we talk about Picasso or something, yeah. um, it's actually interesting because like, I, and I'm generalizing, but I feel like Picasso doesn't, is, 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 is you know, wildly experimental as Picasso is, I feel like he never wants to make a mark in, in general that is like unhinged in this way. Like mm -hmm. he never wants you to forget that he is like a master technician and his mm -hmm. lines are always done like with a lot of intention and it's like in the wrist. And, and actually to make lines like this, you have to push quite hard with your, mm -hmm. so they're like, it, it, you have to like kind of actually be a little bit unhinged. Like it's kind of like the way that like somebody like Johnny Thunders or like a punk guitarist plays guitar like a, mm. or like a hardcore band or a metal band, it's like they're hitting the instrument so hard, and and it's and, it, and, it, and like kind of in a way that's like scraping up the strings, like they could almost break with the force that they're doing. And it's so what you're touching on here is a kind of idea about learning and unlearning, and like the kind of courage that it might require to unlearn certain skills. And certainly, one of the things that as a curator, I had to sort of it's really seductive, but I had to be really careful to avoid was it's really tempting to somewhere in the show be like, look guys, he could draw. Like, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. there are those amazing like early portraits that he made and right. 
you know, there's such a number of examples. He's, you know, he's in his 40s by the time that he fully commits himself to that really gritty, gravelly, crude form of image making. I've got like three decades before that of like verisimilitude that I could slap on the wall. And you have to really um, resist that temptation because, of course, it's the unlearning that's the real essence of why he's so important right. today. But I think that's also what people still struggle with is the idea of this is um, quite a tough and ugly form of image making. And mm -hmm. he doesn't sh he doesn't shy away from that, from the idea that it might feel ugly and uncomfortable. And the, uh, the discomfort yeah. kind of links into thunders and music and some of those experiments. Like there were often moments where I felt like I was reaching for musical analogies to explain what he was doing, that he didn't want to reach for those easy harmonies. He didn't necessarily want something that was going to sit softly on the ear because that was maybe going to feel untrue to actually what his experience of post-war France and post-war culture was, was like. Yeah, it's, it's like very defiant. And, and also it's a, it's a major current in art that he like, it was a, like an artery that he kind of like unblocked. Um, mm. Huge. I mean, you know, there are like some major currents in art, you know, like whatever Duchamp and isms. You know, into, isms. You know, into sort of, you know, yeah, exactly. All these sort of things. And, and uh, <laughs> yeah. why, well, I'm sorry, like you can go on forever, but there's all these, you know, major currents of art that kind of travel through like whatever Duchamp into like Warhol or, you know, or like, uh, you, you, what, I'm just saying like, there's all these different currents and, and did the Dubuffet one is actually kind of untapped because he was sort of bringing into the dialogue art from children an art from, you know, people that were considered to be outsider artists, whether they were like in, uh, you know, like people that were you know, having like, you know, kind of, I, I don't know, we're like the institutions. You know? Yeah, um, in some or, cases, or, or, you know, like, um, yeah, some of them in prison, some of them working in total isolation, but almost all of them without any formal art training. Yeah, And, and his, you use the phrase unhinged, and I think unhinged is quite an old fashioned word, but in a way, I think there's something quite useful for it because it suggests this idea that um, either that our Pandora's box of creativity might be lubricated by someone like that, or that just the whole lid might be entirely removed yeah. and all, all that might be sort of tapped up inside could be released. And you also use the word reckless. And I, I like both of those ideas. And I wonder whether when, you know, when you look at Dubuffet's work, do you, does it provoke you? Does it help you feel unhinged? Does it help you feel? Yeah. Like, like I, yeah, like I, I want to go and make some crazy shit. Yeah. Like I like looking at it and I like when the line quality is all like, you know, just like, messed up and I it's just like it makes me feel I don't know it just gives me like a lot of joy like I like that but I also like the feeling of pushing really hard with a crayon or any mm -hmm. of the like, ways of drawing but but oh I was gonna say also like I remember when I started to to you know to like kind of experiment with that kind of drawing like you know it was kind of in a way inspired by Dubuffet um I was speaking with a friend who's quite uh you know a skilled artist and he was saying I, I can't do it I can't allow myself to make mm -hmm. these lines I can't mm -hmm. It's actually funny that some people can't can't do it. They can't let go in that way to make that kind of to the, that kind of line quality because um, it's just like they're just too neat inside. So let's um, um, on the question of how neat or messy we might be inside. Let's have a look at that Cordedam drawing because I think that's a really good example of some of what you're talking about in terms of line quality um, and certainly in terms of uh, energy. So. To give a bit of context to this, so Dubuffet starts work on his, what he calls his corps de dame or ladies' bodies. And of course, it's relevant that these are dame and not femme. So these are ladies who are being referred to very much as ladies and not women. Um, but also dame could be a colloquial um, reference to prostitutes. So there's a lot of kind of unclear uh, connotations just in the yeah. title of these as Kodadam. And he first of all makes, um, he makes gouache and then he makes uh, a small series of paintings. So we show one yeah. of them, the three of fluids in the show. And then he makes the works on paper as the kind of final resolution of the series. So it's really interesting and important that when we look at a work on paper like this, we know that it's not a preparatory study. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's, Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's not something, 
I've got something stuck in my throat. Um, <laughs> you're gonna have to go. <laughs> I, really love, I really love this picture, and I, I love this whole series. And actually, could we take it off the slide because I wanted to show. Uh, sorry, sorry, Ellen. Are you okay? Yeah, I ate some almonds before the talk because I was oh, like, yeah, yeah, that's the worst. And now it's like it's like it's like, have some, like wood. not it's wood in, in your in your throat. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so, Okay, so, so this that, that those are from the early fifties, right? The quarter dom, right? Yeah, exactly. I brought, I brought this picture, but I thought so. This is like a de Kooning picture. Okay, here we go. Here we go. <laughs> this is from the same year. Uh, mm, this well, is from de Kooning's women. I'm I'm choosing to believe that they probably didn't actually know about each other's work at this time. I, well, it's a big question because Dubuffet goes to New York, and it's very possible that he meets de Kooning, but we don't know. Like, it's okay. a completely, it's one of those kinds of art historical mysteries. Again, if you want to solve both the riddle of Leonardo's um, chicken penis yes. and simultaneously solve the question of whether de Kooning or Dubuffet, who influenced whom, stick it in the chat. We're yeah. all in. Um, a, but to my knowledge, we don't really know. I, I feel like this probably is probably the root of both of you so know that predates both. Yeah, both, both, this is like the Venus of Willendorf. So this yeah. is thirty thousand year old piece of art, right? But this, I believe, it was touring around the time that these that these guys were doing these 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 paintings. I think this was having a comeback at that moment. I think this was in a lot of people's consciousness. Yeah, yeah, like, and uh, and also there was a big. Um, I mean, there was a. I mean, earlier there had been sort of the the Lascaux caves, for instance, are rediscovered in 1940 or discovered in 1940. Sorry, I mean <laughs> discovered since like yeah, yeah, many yeah, yeah, of course, times. Yeah. Um, and after that period, you have a massive kind of resurgence of of interest um, in ancient history and in some of those kinds of in some of those kinds of images and and certainly. One of the questions that was really interesting, um, there are certain moments when you feel really grateful to be a woman as a curator. And one of them is when you have to curate a room of quarter dam paintings and okay. works on paper because you have a real tension at play. Because on the one hand, some people look at those images and they're like, these are really violent and it looks like this woman has been spatchcocked and how can you put okay. this on a wall and who I'll is this? Like, later. I'll, I'll... <laughs> <laughs> who, okay. who, is, who is this misogynist artist who's created right. these images? And then you look at Dubuffet's explanation for what he's doing and he is very clear that he says, yes, this imagery is intended to be violent, but absolutely not at women. Like the violence is entirely intended against the history of the female nude. So what angers him is the idea that like, why should Manet's Olympia be treated as such a shocking and provocative image? Because there she is, you know, lounging on right, her chaise long with a shoe kind of dangling off her foot. And this is still for him, a complete kind of false form of idolatry, which in no way relates to the actual lived experience of a human body of a human form like right. you know so tree of fluids the painting that we show he wants to give yeah. an impression of the fluids circulating within a body yeah, right. okay i was wondering about that okay yeah so you and it you know and it has a kind of like violet stain in the center of yeah. the painting which interpret as you will but it looks pretty menstrual to me yeah. so on the one hand you've got this image making that feels violent and misogynistic and on the other hand you've got this kind of proto-feministic um lashing out against classical imagery and the nude and he says he literally says i wanted to make a protest against the way women are presented on glossy magazine covers. Right. And you're thinking like, is this the same guy? <laughs> I mean, also, you know, what's that, kind of funny yeah. about it is when, when it's actually done not as a statue and it's done in like these sort of picture form and mm -hmm. like the buffet, like we can bring back that slide for a second. Like, oh, sorry, this is the, this is the- no, so you're just kidding. Oh, Rachel, but, I think Adam wants the work oh, on paper. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, but I was gonna say that both of these, um, when they're put on a piece of paper, um, you can, they actually, um, fill up the page in a weird, it actually has to do a lot with the rectangular mm -hmm. shape of a painting. And it's like, yes. I, I only compare it to like, have you ever seen a flayed, a flayed, um, like what is it, a flayed man rug? Have you ever seen that? Like it's a Thai thing, flayed man mm -hmm. rug. It's not really a flayed man, but it's a sort of textile that looks like a flayed <laughs> person if you lay them out. I was gonna say, Adam, like, is is this legal? Like no, a flayed no, 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 man? No, no, no. <laughs> like, but anyway, but, 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 but he's, like, he's actually making the body take almost like the entire picture plane, like the whole. Yeah, yeah exactly. Like it's, rock it's edge to edge. 
it yes. is like it is kind of like a rough go. Well, almost like taking the body and making it f like flattening like a pancake till it takes up the entire paper and looks like a Rothko. It's it's actually playing with like I feel like the the dimensions of what a picture is and like kind of yeah. What is a picture and what is a person yeah. and what does it mean to turn a person into a picture and yeah. how possible is it to turn a person into a picture? Yeah. Like there are really fundamental questions that are being asked by these. But also one of the things, one of the details I really like, which you can maybe like just about work out on this image, is that the women are laughing. Like these are not women who are suffering. Like in these images, these women have these like grins that ecstatic, <laughs> you know, that they're, yeah. they're, they're- I would be laughing too it. if that was me. Um. Yeah, yeah, like oh my, yeah, exactly. I've been jettisoned into this historic, <laughs> historic domain. So well, maybe okay. can we look at a different work? I'd really like to look at the at the tête bluissante, okay. um, the bluing head. So I want to look at this for a few different reasons. I mean, we asked Adam if he wanted to pick out just like a few highlights from the show. We didn't really give any um, parameters. It could be from any period. They could have been five works from the first room as far as I was concerned. And I think it's it's always so revealing and so interesting to, to see what people pick. And, and this work, we like within the team, we call him the man in the moon. We love him. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's so interesting on a number of fields. So I'm obsessed with the work from this period. It's from around the summer of 1954. It's when he's experimenting with enamel paints and he's um, experimenting with things like how you could mix zinc oxide into your enamel paints and you could have this, what he calls a lively incompatibility. So the different materials would react against each other. And so some of the kind of dappled marble quality that you can see wow. like craters in the moon face they're made by the 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 sort of physical reaction between these materials that don't want to sit next to each other um and this work was so Dubuffet was represented for much of his life by Pierre Matisse and this was one of the only works that Pierre Matisse kept so it's still in the Pierre Matisse foundation and um you can just about make out over his eye. He has like a little fleck of red paint. And, and when you see this painting in the flesh, it's so um, shimmering and, and delicate and uh, in the process of it's so alive. Like it's, it feels like, you know, it's called brisson. It, it, it's, it's bluing. It's not blued. It's not over. It's an active verb. It's like generative. And this little fleck of red just like offsets all the colors in the painting. It's, it's really a, it's really a special piece, but t tell us why it was something that, that stood out to you or that you wanted to pick out to talk about. I mean, you know, like some of these ones that are more um, like kind of mysterious and obscured by like shadows and mm -hmm. stuff. I kind of like, I, I was going to show you, like, I thought um, I had a, this is a, this is a book of, um, like, a Fautrier. Um, okay, yeah, Fautrier. nice. Fautrier yeah. Is like a, I think this he's, is Rush? Yeah, he's an influence on, yeah, exactly, yeah, he's an influence on De Buffet, and so this is a mm -hmm. head of a hostage. Mm -hmm. um, this one, too. But, yeah, but these kind of ones, um, amazing. you know how, like, I feel like in these this particular period uh, of, 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 of their work, like you can't really tell what way the characters are looking. Um, like I, it's almost like when you say they're like a cl like a hostage or like a clown or I don't know what they are. Like, they're sort of like, I don't know if they're sort of, I'm not really sure what the, why they're hostages or, or whatever, but but it reminds me of that. And like, I think that he, I think that basically through poetry, Dubuffet got really into texture. Like you got to mm. like kind of drawing on, like, I don't, I don't know if, I can't see this painting in person, but is that sand behind it? Did he use sand in this one? It doesn't have sand in this okay. one, but it has, but it has a very similar quality to the work right. that to the works that do. So it's it's really interesting. I've never thought about this painting in relation to the to the ostage. Um, Fautrier was one of the only artists that Dubuffet ever credited as having been a really important influence on his work. So he goes to visit Fautrier after the war and he's really inspired by what he's doing. And of course, those images are very, um, they're, they're you know, they're literally tortured images. They're born out of his experience of having been um, in camps and hearing people tortured in, in the lands nearby. Um, oh, okay. I didn't know that. Like, cause I, yeah. I really resonated but with it, that. But, but you know, really, so when I was doing these paintings, like uh, these are sort of based on Caravaggio's, but mm. 
I feel like it's kind of became important to me that you couldn't tell which way the character was looking. Mm. For me, like a lot of these characters that I'm drawing are, I think of them as being from like another, another dimension or something or another place that there's like, the, they can't possibly make eye, con eye contact with you. It would be like too right on the nose and it would like, it would just wouldn't be right. Like they, they're not like of this world and they're not like supposed to make eye contact with you. You know what I mean? Because we were talking about Picasso earlier and I think, um, Picasso and Dubuffet is a really interesting thing to hold side by side because they barely talk about one another. There's almost no reference, even though they have a lot like, of crossover and they know a lot of the same people, but like, like Dubuffet just- water or whatever, you know? Yeah, exactly. And Dubuffet just didn't like him. Dubuffet just felt like he was kind of a sellout at a certain point. And um, yeah, and Dubuffet was a great careerist himself. So he wasn't gonna go and like give Pablo loads of credit when he felt right. like he was the great artistic genius. Okay. But, um, but one of the things, I mean, there are a few areas of overlap that I think you do see. And one of them is if you think of um, the way in which um, the face is reconfigured within Picasso. So you think of something like the weeping woman and the way in which these kind of eyes will be looking in different directions. That's amazing. Um, That's an amazing painting. Yeah, and, and similarly, you see that in something like Tête Poussant that we were just looking at, totally. that it has these kind of very small eyes, and there's this sense of, yeah. like, questioning what we see and how we see and how much it's possible to see. Like, how much can any person see another person? Like, what is the act of portraiture? Mm. An act of portraiture is an act of witnessing. Um, and, like, how can a person ever fully witness an another how can that how can that act happen and in a way that really stems in in that experience of the war as well because you know you have to think in that period after the war where it's basically civil war in France in terms of who has been a collaborator and a lot of denouncing and um I think Dubuffet is kind of then when it, there's a lot of portraiture within his work but he's always questioning the degree to which you can make it specific to a personhood you know it's like there's always this sense of continuity that we're all we're all not much loftier than the man in the moon if you know what I mean like ultimately we're all kind of made from mud um right. it never and gets I think like, I'm that he another, eyes part oh, of that what were you saying oh yeah I'm always excited to see another just another take a, that Dubuffet has done on a picture of a person like it's always mm -hmm. makes me happy, like, every time I see it um, you know, and I don't know why, because it's like, it's not really about the person. It's like, it's really just like the, he's able to like spill his internal language all over that. And it's just like, it really just more like of a, it's more just like the, um, you know, like what's being like, uh, kind of like cast, uh, outside of his person, like kind of is, it's sort of like a reflection, you know, almost like, a, almost like if, like, if every day, like these are sort of like the things that he put on a cave wall and like splashed it and splattered it. And it's like, sort of a diary of like who, who Dubuffet was inside at different periods, you know? During yeah, and I think maybe that's also why it feels really exciting because yeah. maybe you have to be the most reckless to do this with portraits because mm -hmm. even the most kind of innovative avant-garde artist, when it comes to actually wanting to capture a person's visage, you know, they want to show that they can have real skill on that front. Right, right. And to be able to capture a person's likeness at the same time as you're, you're both capturing them and completely undoing them and unraveling them as a person and unraveling the idea that their looks necessarily are a window into their soul. Mm -hmm. I think his ability to do those two things at the same time is really reckless like that's why that portrait series which we show in the second room that he shows at René Truin gallery in 1947 like they still feel so wild because you're like yeah. I can't believe you did that to André Dottel like you know right. these amazing kind of figures of the post-war French milieu and he like turns them into these amazing laughable um ridiculous images yeah yeah, um, yeah cool. um so when did you first um I'm kind of curious because if we think about something like we watched the trailer for Aladdin and obviously with Aladdin, we're thinking about how you might like perform within a drawing, how yeah. lines could take on this sculptural quality. And the obvious thing to connect that to is the Cuckoo Bazaar. Yeah, yeah which is like part of the Aura Loop series, right? So yeah, exactly. This, yeah. Is, this is pretty much it. This is, this is like how I got to making Aladdin. So did you... Um, I love, I love this yeah. image. Did you, did you see 
um did you ever get to see the kind of costume elements did you just see the yeah. drawings in it or just photography no i mean well you know i, I did well i mean later like i did a, when i uh, i did an aladdin exhibit at the foundation in baylor in basel right yes yeah. so they, they had the whole exhibit. they had yeah. this. so so i got actually it was cool i got exhibited with this which was amazing um but like uh this um yeah so this uh this series, is called, it's called, I, I'm not, I don't speak French, but it's called like Le, or, Le or Loop, right? So, okay. Cafe. So it, <laughs> this series is really cool in the sense that um, it's like uh, Dubuffet basically, what I heard the story is that he was experimenting with those like kind of like Bic pens or like Biro pens or whatever, where like, you know, there's just like ballpoint pens that are just like red and blue and black and like kind of doodling on notepads and like kind of came up with a system uh, of like a kind of really reduced language where you could just have like a few different symbols and they could be like either like blue lines or red lines that are that were vertical or um, filled in red, blue or black and just white. And then he could just draw shapes. But you could make you could configure those symbols to make like an entire world with just like maybe those like six elements or something. I don't know if they're six, but whatever, something like that. And this is an example of how he made like a world and costumes and people moved around inside of these um these uh, things that were like, basically he made a new material to make a world out of. And this is something that really inspired me when um, I started to, oh, actually, can we take it off of this slide for a second? Um, I, so I, I started- I really love your show and tell. This is so oh, yeah. good. What's good, next? Good. Okay, this so, is so yeah. good. I haven't yeah. seen any of this. Doing these, um, I started using these characters like Garfield and Big Bird and Elmo. And I would start taking their facial features and I would start reducing them down to these sort of little cubic uh, blocks mm -hmm. you know, that were all these sort of, um, you know, that became bricks to build a world with, um, you know, and then I started to reconfigure them. So, you know, into things like this, this was like, yes. you know, so this was Garfield's so great. And, you know, I could, I started to be able to build, you know, to build, um, you know, new new things out of them, like you know, th these were made up. as a Mondrian, basically. Yeah. I haven't seen these. These are yeah. so good. <laughs> these are like big birds, and so yeah. So I was influenced by yeah, exactly by Mondrian and the sort of distill like neoplasticism kind of thing of like reducing things down to cubic blocks. But then also in the Du Buffet or Loop series, which also had to do with the reduction of shapes down to um, uh, down to like a you know just just a few different um, uh, a few different symbols. So basically, I started with just these. I mean, it expanded later to include a lot more symbols. But basically, I think when I started making Aladdin, there was something like just like a dozen or so symbols that the whole movie, the whole world in that movie is uh, made out of. And I was going to show you um, if we look. Um, I'm going to my room for a second. Here we go. Here we go. Don't trip. OK, ready? OK, so where are we, Adam? Are we in Brooklyn? Wait, hold on. So this okay, is like. OK, here we go. This is a plant, a plant orgy. It's a, it's a what orgy? A plant, plant orgy. Right, great. Where are uh, the plants? The plants are, they're, they're all plants. Okay, great. I see. Right, I see. Wait. Okay, wait, hold on. Okay. But anyways, I was going to say that if you look over here, you know, this is still Big Bird's eye. <laughs> okay, yeah. Garfield's cheek. <laughs> you know, and this is still... In the middle of this flower here is Big Bird's tongue. <laughs> so I'm, still, I'm still actually using those elements. Like I'm still using those house, what I called house face, that alphabet. is okay. still, still at large in my work. Um, you know, It's uh, great that you um, call it an alphabet because, you know, that's basically, that's basically what Dubuffet's interested in is like an alphabet is a totally invented language. Like that is a man-made system of signs and we can choose what those signs are and we can choose what they signify basically. And so when he's doing the law loop, in a way it's his most philosophical project because he's saying you can reduce everything, a chair, a typewriter, um, a thought, an idea, like you can reduce it all to this same series of lines and cross hatchings. And, yeah. um, and ultimately that was his feeling about the world was that we'd come to be too precious about our categorizations of different things, our sense of something as an animal, a mineral, a vegetable, right. you know, we had become too strict about that. And we'd lost sight of the fact that we were all star stuff. We'd lost sight mm -hmm. of the idea that we were all 
sort of metaphysically speaking made of the same com components. And so he wanted something that would kind of reduce everything down to the same universal soup. Yeah. Um, I only wish that we could have performed the Cuckoo Bazaar, but sadly the, the elements are so fragile now that you can't. Right. You so. can. But yeah, like, I mean, I, I think, um, you know, making a world out of a, you're trying to make a, a, a you know, building blocks that can make, you know, you can use to do world making. Like, mm -hmm. you know, it's actually so fun because once you ha have just agreed on what the blocks are, everything you make takes on this place of belonging inside that world. And like, mm -hmm. all the, you know, there's really limitless because, you know, like you could make anything out of these symbols. And, and I started to feel like, damn, like I could just, you know, I could make, um, you know, like uh, what's a, like a movie um, like uh, Ace Ventura pet, pet Detective, but I could just make it like all that paper mache and like, you know, and, and build everything out of these symbols. And everyone would be like, this is the best movie I've ever seen. <laughs> Actually, it's a pretty good movie. Well, you should be doing it with like, you should be doing it with like Pasolini's yeah. Journey to Italy. You should, exactly. it needs to be more irreverent. Like it can't be Ace Ventura. Well, it needs, yeah, it needs to be like but, a remaking of The Leopard. But now, what I ended up doing was, you know, was, was making my own scripts and my own, you know, using yeah. my own characters and stuff. But, um, but I would do, um, but I would use, I basically use the entire, world out of the house face symbols mm -hmm. and then i'll write the scripts and have them be you know made up of the lines that i was writing uh you know uh you know just you know as part of like i guess because i'm a, a songwriter i'm always writing lines mm -hmm. i had you know so basically kind of made those come alive in costumes and was able to sort of make a moving sculpture that was a film that you know that that you know that kind of um but but i did it i was able to do it because i you know obviously i had a help from a, a ton a team of mostly volunteers you know that we all made it mm -hmm. at um in a warehouse um, what, about, what about the collaborators you know i'm thinking about um i'm thinking about some of the performers who are in that film you know some of whom were artists themselves some of whom are actors how much did they kind of really understand from the get-go what you were trying to make and how much did you have to explain that to them did you feel like they were able to enter that world did they get well, what you were going for I think that, yeah, well, I had a, drawn a storyboard and uh -huh. um, so I think I, before people started working on the project, I usually went through the storyboard and kind of showed them like what the movie was going to be like. But I think that people looking at the storyboard all drawn in like crayon and looking like that, I think they thought. This is the point where we 3D print ecstasy and this is yeah, the yeah, point yeah. where, you know, like. I, I didn't think, I didn't, I don't think that they thought it was going to look exactly like that. Put it that way. I don't think <laughs> it was exactly like what, what, I, what, what it was like on the paper, but it was pretty much ended up looking like it was drawn with a giant crayon. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I did that by getting this huge paintbrush, like, you know, that was like the thickest paintbrush I could get that w it was kind of like a circular. And, uh, you know, and so and so the thing that's actually consistent about the movie is even though I had, a you know, so many you know people helping me to make the props, I actually took uh, the duty of painting all the black lines in the film myself. So mm -hmm. it's all it's my line in, in the film. Hell. That's um, a massive undertaking. It was a lot. It was a lot of work. I think we spent about six months building that those we built about 30 rooms we did I feel it in, like I need to rewatch it just for the black lines because that's the matrix right basically you were responsible for the matrix and then people could color it in <laughs> like, yeah it was I mean it was just super it was it was such a cool project and it was like it was kind of a community project in a way um but uh, yeah, about, just on the just on the reckless front because I'm this is something that people don't um always talk about but I'm always really interested in about like how do you keep yourself reckless or better still like enable enable that recklessness to keep coming out so i'm thinking about things like you know at art school often there are exercises like doing drawings blind or doing drawings with your left hand or your non-dominant hand or like people continuing to try and find ways to keep that eyes fresh like yeah. Dubuff, he was constantly changing and evolving his language partly because he was trying to surprise himself, even when he was, you know, he shows in, in the Venice Biennale in 1984, he's 83 years old, you know, and he's still trying to catch himself out. Like, how do you, as somebody who's making work in all of these different media, how do you try and keep that fresh? Do you have, do yeah. you have things that you do or ways to be able to, to do that? I don't know, because I kind of keep a list of different things I want to do. like. And mm -hmm. I, try to write, I try to try to write all the time, like different ideas. And I try to constantly have a list. And then I just kind of like um, try to make 
I try to balance out like ideas. Like if something's too serious, I try to add humor to it. If I think it's too mm -hmm. humorous, I try to make it seem like kind of like grotesque or romantic or something just like extreme just to give it like a balance. So kind of like try to, I don't know. I think I'm naturally just a little bit like of a naughty person. Like it's not like, you, know, <laughs> you don't have to work at it. <laughs> yeah, like, kind of just was, like, born a little bit slightly, slightly naughty. Um, but yeah, like, I don't know. Um, I was going to say that um, the, uh, uh, we, we had one more slide, right? Oh, we do. Yeah, we do. Uh, we have the non lieu. Yeah, which is interesting, actually, because I was just talking about him being in his 80s. And I mentioned the word matrix. And this final work really, um, yeah, this work really speaks to both of those ideas. So these are these are the works that he's really making, like right at the end of his life. And my colleague, Camille, who worked with me on the show, you know, when we were installing the show and kind of playing game, if you got to take any work home, what would it be? Like Camille would have taken one of these home in a heartbeat. Yeah, and right. I really, I think he's, um, he's really the ultimate kind of du buffet expert. And I find it kind of fascinating because I think I'm still so much of an aesthete that, um, I would definitely take home something kind of like gritty, but quite pretty. Um, right. Whereas right. these for like the really serious hardcore du buffet fans, uh -huh. this well, yeah. is like the ultimate expression of his experiment. Yeah. Like I, I kind of see these, um, I see this and I, I don't know if I see this cause I think maybe like I read this somewhere, but it's sort of, it's like kind of like a constellation or something. Like mm -hmm. it's sort of like near the end of his life, he was kind of like disintegrating and like kind of just like, was drawing like cos kind of like co a cosmos or something, you know, like- Yeah, uh, they're very as cosmic and they're also really engaging with um, sort of contemporary culture as well. Like he was saying that he was looking at images of the lights in cars on spaghetti junctions in Tokyo. Mm. <laughs> so it, I think he's trying to get at the idea of um, the life force underneath everything, the kind of pulse yeah. beneath that's sort of powering. So, you know, once he was trying to get at the life force in walls or in graffiti or in um, yeah, this, this really does park back. Now it's like reducing it down. So it's totally abstract. He didn't like the word yeah. abstract, but oh, this, 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 does, this, this kind of brings us back to the first drawing of the, of the graffiti on the wall where it does like, because mm -hmm. it has to do a little bit with like kind of an automatic, like logos of the mind, like kind of like, mm -hmm. you know, like we're just sort of like language is forming, but like you might not even have words. It's just kind of like letters and sounds like speaking in tongues. I feel like this is almost like that equivalent of like noise done as like, like no noise and logos as sort of like, you know, the, um, you know, in, in, in this sort of emotional cosmos that's sort of like turning into, to dust again, you know, and like, um, Oh, I was going to say though that like uh, there's I noticed with, with, uh, like you know I don't know if he, I'm I don't know if he like yes. Moreau, but you yes. know Moreau near the end of his life was doing these sort exactly. of exactly exactly you know, um, I don't really know why well that's a constellation painting no that's a constellation painting yeah yeah I, I for some reason people like when they I guess when they're about to die like maybe they're reading the Book of the Dead or no I don't know if they're like. <laughs> Well, really, I think there's a kind of, um, I think there's an ecstatic release sometimes in the end of a person's life. If a person like Dubuffet or like Miro has been able to live a long life and they reach the point of being an octogenarian, sometimes there's that sense of maybe suddenly being in a hurry. Like you feel that with Dubuffet in the last kind of year yeah. or two of his, of his work. It's like he's got this massive impulse to just get this energy committed to the page. And at, at this point he has so much lumbar pain that he can't even work on canvas. So those works are actually made on really large sheets of paper and he's right. doing all the kind of mark making and going at it. And then, um, and then they're glued onto the canvas afterwards. And they, they're they really high octane. When you see them in person, it's not just that the color has this amazing impact. It's also that, just the force of the mark making, like you, you are really kind of blown sideways by them. W whether or not they're the ones you would take home or not, you kind of have to acknowledge that they, they have a lot of vitality. Oh, I was going to show you this one. That I thought was kind of funny, but I can't find it. Um, oh, here, because um, because we, we, we were talking earlier about uh, Picasso, and uh, and how how much really like his work doesn't intersect with Dubuffet in, in many ways because mm -hmm. of the way that he wants to make lines, but. Actually, Picasso at the end of his life, his last drawing, <laughs> like this. So it's kind of funny that Picasso at the end of his life, like the really like li this literally, I think his last portrait, like decided to try something Dubuffet-ish, like 
It's you know? really interesting. Hold, yeah. hold, hold up the car, the le voiture, the car piece that you had earlier on. If you still got that to hand, because yeah, um, those are kind of interesting in terms of line making to hold side by side. Oh. Now I'm really asking something. Do I have it still? Oh, here, here. Okay. <laughs> hey, yeah. see. Yes, yeah, so Ken Picasso. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> I won't touch, I won't touch uh, drawing like unhinged lines at the end. Is like yeah, a bit the sheer hinged, frontality yeah. of that face, the yeah. mask likeness of it, the sense of um, the flatness of the line and the strength of the inscription. That being a kind of graffitied face, and also the um, the amb the gender ambiguity. Like who yeah. you know, who's that a portrait of? It's a portrait of a skull, but could we gender that skull? It's like it's really an ambivalent place. Picasso. It's like a it's a real it's a, it's a really good one um you know he, he was really good at it i wish he did like tons of work like that um, mm. but, um yeah like oh you know so i was gonna say this is i don't know if we talk about this because I, I realized i had printed out these ones and we can also like i don't know this night is today is i'm sorry like i know i'm supposed to play music and i will i should play a song it's coming, but, uh, it's coming. Okay. don't worry yeah okay, so these are um these are gaston chasek yes yeah 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 he was a really important figure for dubuffet this is like I just wanted to give him a little credit because I think that even though I was influenced by Dubuffet, I'm pretty sure that Dubuffet was a little bit. Definitely. He, he had, um, yeah, he collected work by Shisak. So um, yeah, so Shisak's a really interesting figure because he collects him in his collection de la Bru. And he then, um, he then has this like really extensive com uh, conversation. He has this huge correspondence with Shisak and eventually um, Shesak is recategorized in the collection. So that's one of the most um, controversial things that he does. Like the art brut or something, right? Yeah, right. so no, but like basically art, right? there are a few artists that Dubuffet decides later in his life are actually not art brut enough. <laughs> and Shesak oh, is one of them. I thought he Shesak decides- was like a teacher or something. I thought T Shesak was like, I mean, I, I feel like it's funny because it's like, it's like if you're just not famous, like you're art brut or something like he like, Shesak <laughs> was like, it's just like, I thought he was just like a really good artist from Dubuffet's time, but he didn't get famous. So it's like, oh, Nicole, you, now you're an outsider artist. It's like kind of just an artist that he was like, obviously really liked the sculpture of. And yeah, copy, but, uh, yeah but exactly. I, I you said it, it not me, but yeah. Going back to that, apparently Chasek, when, when people asked him what he was doing, he was like, I'm kind of doing like a Picasso kind of thing. Like, but Chasek felt mm -hmm. that he was like doing a sort of Picasso th thing himself. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. Yeah. He also made these amazing, he had a like really varied and really interesting practice. If anyone's interested to look at more of it and the whole of their correspondence has been published. So that's also really worth having a look at. So Adam, th this conversation could run all night. Like you and I could talk yep. forever about Dubuffet and Twombly and uh, post-war art and also, you know, l like Bart Simpson and uh, how you might reduce these things to a kind of <laughs> its own semiotics. But it is 7.57 in the yes. UK. And for your fans internationally, it's probably... Like, where are you now? 2.57? Where are you? Something like that. We're, we're so you've got three minutes here. and you promised me a song. So okay. I want to know if there's going to be a song. Okay. Meanwhile, people can right. see you. Bob Dylan. This is a song. Um, that I the right, it's because I've got this, like, he's just being so right. cute. Right. So this is a song um, by, it's, it was written by me and my friend Jack Dishel, and it's uh, from oh, my yeah. album, Minor Love. So I'll play It's called The Boss Inside. How do you find a guy around here? I've already sped through a year. I've already tried all the campus bars at night. Even cried alone at the diner. Somewhere there's a prince and he likes to strike me down. I know I'm not the reason, I'm just the one he found. And all these other cowards, they're not hard to boss around. You just get them in your arms and you hold them till they drown. I walked back to the cottage with no hand around my wrist when I heard the sound of vodka bottles breaking. I went out to the clearing, he was standing with a fist but I couldn't see the face that he was making. He said, make me some dinner. 
I said, you thought you'd never ask. He was standing in my kitchen. I was filling up his glass. He finally started screaming and pointing to the bed. He wanted me to kill him, but I took his life instead. Ugly moments strung together. And the poor guy couldn't even find his temper. And he could no longer make me cry. I guess the boss inside of him died. I guess the boss inside of him died. I guess the boss inside of him died. <laughs> Thank you. Hey! Thank you so much. Thank you, Adam. Thank you. Thanks for having what me. A fun, um, what a fun evening. I only wish with all my heart you could have come and seen the show. Well, I know. I know. That was like a real bummer because I, I was pretty sure I was going to come see it back before all the Back before the plague. But the plague happened and we managed to put the show on and we managed to do this talk online. And thank yeah. you for this. Thank you so much for having me. And, uh, it's it's really fun. You know, uh, and uh, an honor to be part of, you know, to, to be part of the uh, exhibit in this way. So. Um, and thanks for everyone for joining us tonight and have a lovely evening or an afternoon, depending on where you are. All right, folks. See you bye, soon. Guys. Bye. Bye.